Oh, just way to completely interrupt me there. Welcome back to NGTV Plays Pillars of Eternity, featuring myself, Spencer, your host for this particular series of episodes. And uh, let's go ahead and loot, shall we? We got a club, we got a dagger, we got simple clothing. Let's just, why not grab everything, right? All right, cool. And why are we... Oh, that's right. Every time I, I start and do the episode, I it's all S to, to stop recording, and it happens every time. I don't know what it is. I mean, I do know what it is, but I'm not going to change it, so it's just going to be a thing now, I guess. What do we got here? We got villager, villager, villager. Orland. Wait, Orland. Oh, uh, oh, he's an Orland server. Okay. Brethren. Swainer. Okay, so I can talk to him. Gafwin. We got here villager, villager, villager. So, okay, Selena Vertivo, Strom Brightblade. Okay, okay, Pasca. Please sit where you like. Would you like a drink or a room? We have two available at the moment. I'm afraid we can't offer much by the way of a good meal today. She sighs. Unless you're fond of cold porridge. Eh, you know, I'm. Okay, see, I don't understand that. They're like, oh, well, we don't have much food, but we have cold porridge. Well, do you also have a place to heat the cold porridge? You could have warm porridge if you just... There, I see it right there. You could... Like, there's a fire, and you could probably put the porridge on top of this stone thing. It probably heats up, right? And then you could heat the porridge. There's two fires, even. I bet you I could find a third fire somewhere. Why is it just cold porridge? You could reheat porridge. That's all I'm trying to say. I like room, please. Keep them nice and tidy. Nice. All right, so we got the common room. It's zero CP, but I have... Okay, ends allow characters to rest without using camping supplies. Cheap rooms are usually available, but if you have copper to spend, you might uh, consider the more expensive rooms. We have 264. Um, I think laborers rest. I mean, it's only 40 more to get the plus two resolve, but the plus one perception and mechanics is probably useful. Maybe? It's very interesting. I kind of like how it gives you pluses like that. It's only 40 more. No, I should... I mean, like, I want to get pluses, but I... Yeah, we're fine. Your sleep is restless and fevered, assaulted by hisses and whispers, blanketed with a suffocating anxiety. You open your eyes to awaken, and find yourself in front of Gilded Vale's gallows tree, the creaking of its ropes getting lo growing louder in your mind until the sound is deafening. Hanging from the tree is an old dwarf woman, whose face is shriveled inward like moldering fruit. Her head hangs limply to one side. As you look at her, she looms f larger and larger in your mind until she is mere inches from your face. Suddenly her head snaps up. And her eyes open, and they are empty, and behind them is a vast nothingness that makes your stomach drop. Her mouth slowly parts with, with a guth, with a guth, and with a gust of rancid air, she speaks a word: "Watcher." You jolt awake. The foul smell of the dwarf wo woman's breath still permeating your nostrils. Sweat runs down your face, and thick droplets in your skin is soaked from head to toe. You remember the woman. You remember seeing her de decaying face when you spoke with the magistrate. He called her an animancer. Though it fills you with a new queasy apprehension, you feel a strange compulsion to see this woman once more, if only to confirm she is truly dead. Okay, seek out for your condition. Find the dwarf woman from the dream. Alright, well that's easy enough. Let me go first talk to Swainer. Greetings. Don't you know who you are and uh, don't know who you are and don't much care. Keep walking. We're not here to chat with foreigners. Aloth narrows his eyes careful. Looks like they're cut from the same cloth as those rowdies who attacked me. He wrinkled his nose. Smells like it, too. Almost says you've been threatening his family. I saw you outside the mill. What was that about? Well, someone fancies them a metal, uh, fancies themselves a meddler, eh? What's that about? It's about Trumple, uh, thinking he's king of the town on account of he's got the mill to his name. The dwarf's a jowls quiver with rage. It's, it's about him barely giving us anything for the wheat we bring him. And then cutting our purses when we need to buy grain. It's about farmers going hungry while some bastard gets rich off their crops. That's what it's fucking about. Now shove off. 
Hmm. What are you doing in here, then? Maybe I could talk to him for you. Ha! You think you'll get through to him w when we haven't? The man's thick as a peat bog. I hear he's got soul reed. Bound his kin used to grow sun reed trees for their adherent lords up until they figured out their side was losing. Explains why his knees still ache to bend whenever our lord or lady crosses the road. Okay, not really sure what that means. Let's take as a peat bog. Okay. I hear he got his soul red. Oh, okay. And his kin used to grow sun reed trees. Okay. So because he got his soul red, he realized that he was... Okay, so he's saying that the guy thinks he's some kind of powerful person because of his... his ancestry um he'll be holed up in that mill for days the coward but here if you want to give it a shot then good luck we'll all you want if you manage it huh so i just put myself in a predicament i don't know who's right and who's wrong it's a tough it's, it's a tough situation i'll talk to him again later and see if maybe something changes let's go let's go talk to these people you see a woman emptying her satchel onto her bed. Taking stock of her inventory, potions, bandages, tinctures, and herbs are scattered throughout her room haphazardly. She bites her lip, head tilted to the side, considering. She begins to repack one item after the other, careful deliberation undercut by shaking hands. Each item has a clearly marked place, but no matter how she repacks it, she isn't satisfied. The shaking worsens as she empties it out once more. One hand held to her mouth, tears eke from her eyes as she gives up all semblance of order and shoves everything she can in the satchel, grabbing it and running out of the bear house. Straightening her back as she walks to the docks, chin high, eyes hard and red, a gangly young elf offers his condolences, but she can't see him for the ocean ahead of her. She wanders the docks, offering her services as a doctor to any who will listen, anyone handing out, yeah, anyone heading out on high tide. Less than an hour later, she watches her childhood disappear in the distance, a tiny speck of an island, and tries not to jump. Oof. I figured it out. What we're seeing is people's reasons for coming to Gilded Vale because they had a thing with with uh, wanting settlers to come here. So everyone we're seeing their past that led them to this point. You see a group of young men standing around a makeshift practice target. This man stands in the middle of them, explaining the construction and the and the use of a bow. He holds it up, pointing out each part as he speaks about it and what it does. He then walks away from the target, telling them to remain where they are, and takes his place about 200 feet away. He carefully lines up his shot, explaining what he's doing as he does it, and lets the arrow fly. It hits the target dead center, much to the surprise and delight of the boys near it. He smiles, walking toward the boys, talking about proper stance and how to most effectively hold a bow. A noise comes from the tree line near their practice venue, and he stops, scanning the woods, blue eyes squinting against the sun. A shadow moves, making its way through the forest behind them. He draws an arrow and lines up the shot, carefully tracking the motion of the hidden creature. Losing the, uh, loosing the arrow, he wastes no time and quickly grabs another. The boys spin, watching the arrow fly into the forest, immediately lost among the trees. There is sudden explosive movement in the undergrowth as a deer erupts from the tree line. Running across the edge of the, seat of the clearing, the boys laugh, turning to joke with the man about his lousy shot. They stop talking, seeing him holding the bow and, and leading the deer with a mocked arrow. They drop to the ground as he loses his last arrow, which flies true and strikes the deer right behind its shoulder, piercing the heart and lungs and dropping it dead almost immediately. The boys stare at the deer for a few seconds and then slowly turn to look at the man, newfound respect in their eyes. He smiles again and breathes a quiet sigh of relief. Oof. I'm glad they don't think I'm an idiot. <laughs> but his wasn't okay so m maybe I don't have the full thing figured out but I, I feel like I have it partially figured out at least I'm seeing so many resemblances to Baldur's Gate in this game and not just like the way it looks but the, the pacing and the type of story it is Carouser Carouser sing us a song Belissa Man okay this in guest ah yes this old game oh looks like we're going back in you see a man soar through the air hitting a nearby wall with a nauseating crunch he doesn't get up his attacker a burly clean cut warrior with a carnivorous grin turns and shoves his fist into the stomach of another assailant removing another from the impromptu brawl the bar is a whirlwind of elbows knees fists and feet with no end in sight and he is in his element 
In the corner, three smaller men speak quietly, throwing malicious glances at the larger man in the center. He breaks a chair over a tattooed head, cackling. The trio position themselves in three parts of the room, and with a terse nod, they, ch they charge. Unfortunately for them, the man sees them coming. Something in his eyes burns brightly, and all three slump to the ground in agony. That's all in their minds. Oh, and in an agony, that's all in their minds. The burly man bows to a room of the unconscious and incapacitated before sauntering out, off-key whistle trailing behind him. Not only is he strong, he's also mentally powerful. See that I'm in. Okay. You see a long, empty road cutting through two large crop fields. The air is silent and the land seems too still for an early afternoon. This woman walks slowly on the road, leading a horse, curiously looking around. She seems to sense something wrong, but is unable to discern what it is. She stops, sniffing at the air, her nose high, her brow crinkles, and she casts about, looking for something. The air is clear, no clouds. She sniffs again, still looking around, confusion clouding her face, mouthing a single word. Fire? She looks out across the field, feels her confusion turning to fear. She tur holds up her hand to a block the sun from her eyes and scans the field again. Not finding what she was looking for, she jumps onto her horse's back, fear quickly becoming panic. She kicks, sending the horse shooting down the path, which bends around some trees to where the farmhouse should be. She pulls up short, horror now resident on her face as she stares at the burned and charred mess that used to be her family's home. Tears well in her, in her eyes as she kicks again, racing to the rubble. She didn't see the smoke? Ah, Shane shakes Muller in. You see an emaciated boy in chains, black holes for eyes, staring sightlessly at a wall. A man in a dark coat walks in, a scroll and an oddly shaped quill in his hand. The boy glances at him expressionless, a corpse waiting for animation. The man clucks at him, disapproval clear in his voice. The boy stands, limbs hanging. The man takes the quill and begins to write on the boy's chest, copying sharp, angular symbols from the scroll. The child doesn't flinch as the quill digs into the skin, drawing blood as it goes. The wizard finishes with a flourish and barks some arcane command, setting the symbols to glow dully. The boy cries out, knees hitting the stone hard, his chest burning black and red. Finally, the glow disappears, leaving only hard black scars edged into his skin. He slumps sideways, twitching, his eyes facing the back of his skull. The wizard grunts, kicking him on the leg on his way out. The boy lies on the floor until dawn, eyes still black like holes, the twitches growing into convulsive shakes. That's fucked up. in this room. Oh, I'm out of sight from the back. It's nice. What do we got here? Okay, okay. So far so good. What do we got here? Oh, dear road part one. No other land has such a wild and bloody recent history. From colony to Palatinate to Free Republic, the Deerwood has undergone a trial by fire to emerge as a powerful force of the Eastern Reach. Deerwood's history actually begins in in, in Adir, Adir in 2602 AI. Adir explorers returned from a journey across the ocean with tales of treasures they found. They discovered countless ruins scattered through the forest as well as plains to the north of the trees that would be perfect for growing vorlas. There was a problem, however. The locals were hostile, and there was a potential for conflict. The fair Kerning of 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 Ader, fair Koning, first king. Okay, the first king of of Ader, um, or Adir. I, I can never remember, remember which one. I think it's Adir. Knew that this was too good an opportunity to pass up, and sent more explorers to, to scout and map the area. Exploration continued over the next twenty years. Small groups of explorers traveled back and forth between Ad Adir. And this new world with, with a handful of colonists setting up small camps to establish a base for the explorers to work out of. Conflicts with the locals who, who the, oh my god, Adirans learned are called Glanfathans were rare, but frequent enough for the, the first king to send a small squadron of guards to help protect his citizens. These guards established a central base on a river in the western section of the woods. This settlement would eventually become the city of Deerford upon which the modern-day village of the same name is presently built. Once that base was established, the first permanent Adiran uh, settlements began north and west of the Bale River. Over the next three years, thousands of Adirans made the trek from Adir, uh, Adir to this new land. Uh, the Glenfathans, who seemed to revere the ruins scattered around the forest, caused a few problems with some of these settlements. 
especially those found near the ruins themselves. These were easily taken care of by the colonists with the help of the Imperial Guard. The Adirans, in order to further their foothold in the area, reduced the cost of production in an attempt to keep the Clan Fathan population under control, started making slaves out of any Clan Fathans captured during the uprisings. This resulted in a great increase in tension between the two groups. With the population of the area growing, an official governmental structure was established by the, uh, by the first king. He appointed several earls to preside over the land and assigned them thanes to help run their territories, and they called the new Grafram the Deerwood. Deerford remained at the center for the Imperial Guard, but the settlement in Pearlwood Gulf, New Dunrid, was the true seat of power for the area, sitting at the edge of this ocean forest fertile farmland and a river that runs from the coast of the White March, settlers flocked to the area, hoping to establish names, names for themselves. A deer began to spread across the new land. Oh, well, that's nice. Um, all of them? What the hell? Okay. So far, so good. I don't remember if we're in a Glenfathen place or a deer... I think we're in a Glenfathen place, so... Hound stares intently at the covered window, its head cocked as if waiting to hear a particular sound. He looks up when you approach and whines a low note, tail wagging slightly. Pet the dog. The dog's tail thumps happily against the floorboards. Apparently this requires loading an entirely new area. Ah, we're outside, that's why. Got villager after villager after villager. Then I told her that's not the pistol. Ah! It's funny. It's over here. If you have difficulty distinguishing, blah blah blah, it doesn't matter anymore now. Alfra. A dear wooden woman is standing in front of the fireplace, humming a quiet tune to herself, or perhaps to her unborn child, for she is clearly quite pregnant. She turns her head slightly as you enter. Hello. Well, finally, I was starting to think, the woman makes a startled noise when she turns around and sees, sees you. Oh, I'm sorry, I was expecting someone else. She gives you a cautious smile. Can I help you? I like how in games like this, you can just enter people's houses, and their first answer is, what can I do for you, instead of, why the fuck are you in my house? I didn't get a veil, thought I'd get to know the locals. Nice cat. Oh, there's a cat. I was like, where the fuck is the cat? Or... Were you with one of the caravans? She looks at you hopefully. Master Odemus, by chance? I was, yes. I'm afraid the rest of the caravan was killed. Wait, why do you ask? My sister Cle- Oh no, I, 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 I was afraid of this. I was afraid after she mentioned Odema that she was going to be the sister and the secret that she was keeping from her sister that she wanted to tell her was that the fact that she was pregnant. Oh no. My sister Cleisha is traveling with one of the caravans. She sent a letter before she came. She said she was going to pay her way by working as a guard for the caravan master. She always ha she always was a tough one. I don't suppose you've seen her on the road? Or the caravan, perhaps? It's Master Odemas. But she didn't make it. Alpha covers her mouth with a hand, eyes wide with horror. For a few moments, she can manage nothing but a strangled, voiceless gasping, her eyes brimming with tears. I knew... I told her it was a dangerous path to take. Kalisha was always so certain she could take on any danger. Oh, my poor sister. I'm sorry, stranger. I just... I can't believe she's gone. If only I hadn't called her here. If I hadn't written to her, she might still be alive somewhere. Oh, probably gonna... You know, maybe I can help you out. She looks at you with some surprise before dabbing in her nose with a sleeve. That's kind of you to offer, but I don't know if I could... If I could impose this on you. It's not a small favor. Let me guess. Get me out of this town because I have a child and I'm afraid that's hollowborn? I'm worried about the baby, about the legacy. I told Cleisha as much as I could, but I know that. I, but all I know is that for a long time now, every child born in Gildavale has been soulless, empty. It's happened to so many, so many mothers, and Lord Raedric, he's exiled all of them, calling it a sign of the gods' desire. She sniffs. With my Hathor gone, I don't know how I'd manage if I lost my home, too. I think it's Hathor. I don't know. I hoped Cleisha would help me. Or could help me. They say Ranga, the old midwife, knows a way to prevent a child being hollowborn, but she moved south to Anslogs. Or Anslogs? Sl sl I, I don't know what the umlauts do, I'm sorry. Compass 
uh, two seasons ago. The journey is too far for me. I can't make it as I am, but I don't have anyone else now with Kalisha gone. Please, can you help me? Oh. I'll find a ring for you. You have earned a reputation. Reputations can be held with communities or factions in each to reach and will affect how members of that group respond to you. Oh, nice. I earned a reputation. Alfred blinks eyes wide. You will? Oh, gods bless you. Here, I'll give you coin or uh, to, to pair with. You needn't trouble yourself with that. I think it's the drinks she fashions out of. Well, I'm not sure. But it shouldn't be too much of a burden to carry back. Anselog's compass is what we call the lagoon to the south. You'll have to cross the wilds to get there. That's what she keeps... That's what keeps me from trying it myself. She clasps her hands together. Thank you again, truly. You'll be saving us both. She sets a hand on her stomach, smiling through her tears. A mother's plea. Okay. Ooh, different languages. What's over here? More people. Locks the usurper. You see a lone man standing in a field. He looks around surveying the crops. Occasionally he bends to examine a leaf up close. He is intent on what he is doing, completely absorbed in his work. This man approaches him from behind. He moves slowly but does nothing to mask his approach. In his hand he holds a large sword. There appears to be no malice or hatred in the man's demeanor. He almost seems pleased. The first man hears his approach and stands, turning away from the plant he was inspecting. His face breaks into a smile and opens his arms to welcome the approaching man. The smile freezes into a grimace as the second man thrusts his sword through his stomach. Its blade now protruding from his back, his arms slowly fall to his side and blood starts to drip from the sword onto the plants below the men. As the first man crumbles to his knees, the second pulls his sword out, a tear slowly falling down the cheek of his still smiling face. I don't think he meant to do that. Clink. You see a small group of people gathered around the ruins of a house. The destruction continues out, of, out from the single dwelling through the entire village. Not a single building, building still stands. Rubble is scattered everywhere. One of the men in the group leans over something in the debris. It, it is this man, younger, barely more than a boy. This man, the man reaches out and shakes the boy by the shoulder. The boy makes no sound and doesn't respond to the man's disturbance. The man looks up at the other members of the group and shrugs. Standing to rejoin his friends, the boy suddenly sits up, eyes wide. He scrambles backward, away from the group. Looking around in horror, the group moves toward him in unison, el eliciting a yelp from the boy, who tries to move farther away. A woman in the group puts out her hand, stopping the rest. Uh, she turns to, to them reproachfully, motions for them to stay, then looks at the boy on the ground, who is trying to push himself through what remains of a wall. He seems unaware that he, he is he has even stopped. The woman slowly moves toward the boy, hands out, speaking in a low, calming tone. For a time, the boy doesn't even hear. He just closes his eyes and braces himself against the wall, expecting violence. Eventually, the woman's words work through the fear, and he and he hears her. He opens a tear -filled, his tear-filled eyes and stares at her. She holds out a hand to him. He looks at it, seemingly confused by the offer, then hesitantly reaches out. She takes his hand in hers and leans down to help him stand. Oh, he... Must have really survived some atrocity. It's interesting that we're learning the backstory about these people, but I want to know if these people are just like one-shot situations and that's it, and just here for flavor, or we're going to see these people later on. Okay, what do we got here? Kara Loth. You see a crowded marketplace, vendor stalls lining the road, their proprietor's voices calling out to passers-by to, to come sample their wares. The woman wanders through the throng, strolling hand-in-hand -hand with another woman. They peruse the vendor's goods, tearing at a book merchant with a number of old and beautiful- Oh, did I already listen to this one? I think I did. Okay. My bad. I just made full circuit of the town. Whoopsie-daisy. Okay. So, what do I need to be doing right now? Okay, so I can travel to Anslog's Compass and speak to Mother Ranga. Or I can travel to the Black Meadow. Or I can resolve the feud between Trumbull and Swainer. I do not know what I need to do. Let's see here. Hmm. 
Find the dwarf woman from the dream. Oh, yeah. Let me do that. Oh, there she is. Hello, a dwarf woman. The squat, distended body of an elderly dwarf woman dangles from the thin, crooked bow that sags at the tug of her noose. The bloated purple flesh of her neck torn away in patches like moth-eaten linen bulges over the rope that suspends her, and her lifeless head lolls forward rigidly from one side to the other when the breeze shifts. You perceive a faint glow around her that casts no light on its surroundings, but there is a tepid warmth to it, and you feel somehow that you could reach out and touch it, not with your hands, but with some aspect of yourself that has no worldly dimension. Reach out. You take a deep breath, clearing your mind, focusing on your objective. As you exhale, you feel yourself spreading out toward the hanging woman, perceiving all that lies between you and her with new, unfamiliar awareness. Once you have expanded enough to reach her, there is a sudden jolt to your mind, a ringing electric surge of images and words and sounds. Involuntarily, you shut your eyes and feel yourself being pulled down to some deeper consciousness in a space occupied only by you and the hanging woman. And when you open them again, she is staring at you with eyes clouded in a milky fog, her body still swaying in a wind you no longer feel from a tree that stands planted in a misty void. The woman gives a slow nod of her head, the rope creaking as she does so, and she smiles at you. Have you come have here, you come for, here no? for me, dear? Or have you gotten lost? Ah, uh, it is both, I think. Yes? No, I think not. A pity that. It would be simpler. A mercy, then. Do not have to wander anymore, no? Alas, we are here, you and I, wherever here may be. Okay. The world looks a little different than it used to, is that it? Feels like you're noticing things for the first time that have always been there? A little bit, yeah. You have seen past the shroud. It only takes an instant. Your soul remembers, yes? Remembers how it sees when it leaves the body, like being reminded of a dream you had forgotten. You are a watcher now, and a watcher you will stay. Alrighty, that's interesting. What's a watcher? What indeed? Long hours have many animancers spent studying such things. Not I, no. Not I. I'll tell you what I know, though, since fair is fair, and here we are visiting you and I, and it reminds me of better times. Souls pass on, some say through Audra stones, which are the blood veins of the world. They leave the world for a time and are reborn into it, sometimes more than they were before, but usually less and seldom the same. For all souls, there is a time where they do not live, yet have not passed on. And those souls roam the world, same as you or I, either living or lost. But no one sees them because they have forgotten how. Okay. A watcher sees, though, knows what to look for. And sometimes they know a person just by looking at them. Know where they've been in ages past when their bodies were other bodies. See memories even their owner can't recall. A wonder to behold when all goes well. A wonder. Hmm. Oh, nothing to be afraid of, I'm sure. It's just much to take in for some. Sometimes there's trouble sleeping or other difficulties. Okay, she smiles at you reassuringly, fanning out a tuft of long whiskers that sprouts from one of her cheeks. You should see old Meerwald. He could tell you much more than I. A watcher just like you. Helped many in his day. 
took up in an old keep no one would claim. Not far, not far. Kadua, beyond the Black Meadow. He will welcome the company. Did you now, dear? My, that would be something, wouldn't it? Could be luck, could certainly be. A storm can be a careless thing. Okay. Or maybe it got its hands around your soul but couldn't pick it up. A soul can be heavy if it stayed in one piece through its time. Strong souls, we call them in the trade. Oh, what's a bloke name? I mean, call them. Those days are all behind, you know? Oh, yes. Entropy. Rima Gan's work. We know little of why or how. We lose pieces of ourselves when we die and pick up pieces of others when we are born again. But less than what we lost. We try to stop it with the animantic sciences, but with little success. Interesting that she calls it sciences. A very small few resist Rimargan's influence and stay together through some force of defiance, at least for a time. But they all succumb eventually, I think. Me? <laughs> I'll bore you to tears, though. A student of the soul. Something so basic, yet so poorly understood. But so many breakthroughs have been made in my lifetime. Had been made. Had been. To hear the locals tell it, we're a gang of soul manglers that preys upon the weak-minded. And the worst of us are. But the best of us? The best? Inspirations. Miracle workers. My parents were soul twins. Miserable before they met. Empty inside. It was an animancer who helped one find the other. Turn their lives around. You wouldn't be I need, I need an animal, sir. Amnesiacs helped to remember their lives. The suicidal brought back from the brink of oblivion. The elderly afforded extra moments to say their goodbyes. How soon we forget when we're afraid. Hmm. It's a fascinating science. A fascinating time to be alive in a place like Deerwood that does not control the research, no? I love the Valian Republics for many things, but their recent caution will leave them behind, I fear. Okay, interesting. Goodbye, my dear. It was lovely visiting. Alright, Caldera. Closes her eyes and her, her head slumps forward over the noose, and your surroundings seem to bleed into your vision from some unknown place of waiting. Are you alright? You seemed lost just now. This happens a lot, y'all get used to it. I'll be honest with him. I'm a watcher. Well, that is interesting. And I expect this has something to do with the hooded figures in the ruins, hmm? In any case, I appreciate your honesty. Since we're traveling together, it's probably wise for us to share these things. You know anything about watchers? Only that they're rare and that they seem to have unique insights into certain soul conditions. As you, Justin, demonstrated. Let's continue on. Perfect. Okay, so I know what I'll do. I'm going to head down to Angful, blah, blah. Get that, come back, give it to the sister, and then head to the Black Meadow, and then head past the Black Meadow and talk to the guy, and then come back. But we'll have to do that next episode. Uh, thank you guys so much for watching. If you enjoyed this, you can hit the like button if you want to see some more. Subscribe. I will see you next time.